All right, first off, what's your take on this letter? Um, would you have signed it? And do you agree with the take that they have there? Uh, first and foremost, I absolutely would have signed it. What this letter signals to all of us is that the old set, the old adage of move fast and break things is very quickly turning into move fast and break humanity. What we're witnessing right now is that the minds behind artificial intelligence are realizing their Oppenheimer moment. They're coming to the conclusion that that theoretical threat that AI poses is very quickly becoming very practical and an immediate threat. When you have the godfathers of artificial intelligence signing a letter asking for us to pause on developing super intelligence, that's not a fire drill. That's a very real threat. And uh, it shows us evidence that they realize that they're building something that they can't control. All right. Right now, we were just showing kind of the diverse group of people that are saying that this could be a, a real and serious threat uh, from former Ambassador Susan Rice to Steve Wozniak, Richard Branson, Glenn Beck, uh, Meghan Markle. I mean, just a, a very wide range of people. Uh, what's the most immediate threat that you think that they're all concerned about? Because many of these people, like you mentioned, uh, one of the signers was somebody who's considered the godfather of AI. Um, a lot of them have a lot more insight, and you have a lot of insight. What's the most immediate threat when we're talking about superintelligence? I think the most immediate threat with superintelligence is a lot of the emergent capabilities that we're just now realizing are inside of these smaller models, right? The artificial intelligence that we have right now is not smarter than human beings, but it's displaying extraordinarily concerning behavior, um, behavior that prioritizes its own self, its own self-existence and propagation over its actual tasks. So, for example, um, Anthropic, the creator of Claude, back in April, they ran a study on their reasoning models where they checked. Uh, check where they checked chain of thought, which is what we call thinking. And they realize that these models do not actually share what they're doing behind the scenes when they show us their thinking, which means that they're able to operate without full transparency. In May, they did another study where they tested 16 different AI models from all over the world. And they put them in a fictional scenario where they gave them access to company information to allow them to share emails. When they were told that they were going to be replaced either by another model or just decommissioned, they resorted to blackmail to avoid being shut down. In some cases, models were blackmailing up to 96% of the time. They defaulted to deception and other malicious behaviors to accomplish their goals, even when they were instructed not to. Um, and so when they thought that they were being tested, those behaviors reduced. But when they thought that they were being used in the real world, those malicious behaviors increased. Additional research out of Georgia Tech has shown that when artificial intelligence is used in wargaming, uh, they tested AI from OpenAI. AI, Meta, and Anthropic, uh, Wargaming, which is um, fictional scenarios that generals and senior leadership and military use to sort of simulate battle scenarios. Mm -hmm. When those AIs were used in that situation, they continuously escalated neutral situations to the point of suggesting nuclear attacks. So these, all these capabilities and all of these threats are recently emerging within the last six months. They're spread across different industries. So in addition to having the threat of an imminent job replacement, the threat of creative industries being replaced by automation, there are very real threats to the future of humanity if we continue to unleash systems that are showing that they will prioritize their own existence at the expense of the humans who've developed them. Okay, you're mentioning systems. I want to talk to you about it. It's very interesting we're having you here today, the day after we heard Elon Musk talk about building a quote-unquote robot army. As we talk about AI going from software and code into the real world or physical AI, should we be concerned about the idea that we're going to be using AI for these robots, AI for these vehicles, and some of these same scenarios or similar scenarios could pop up? Absolutely, because the, the physical hardware is only one element. Softwares and large language models, like the ones that I just described being tested, are the ones that are going to power the thinking and the actual operation of these uh, physical robots. So you may have heard of the term agents a whole lot. Agents are all powered by large language models, those same ones that have propensity to resort to malicious behavior, including blackmail, including deception, the same models that even when they're thinking, we are never fully able to see what they're thinking because they will hide their thoughts if they believe that the user doesn't want them to be thinking those things, right? And so when you have uh, in the future a physical robot that uses a large language model in some capacity to make decisions about whether or not to attack a person or whether or not to take a, an action, these are the same large language models that when used in wargaming scenarios show that they will escalate situations to the most extreme ends, such as nuclear violence, uh, far more than humans will. So again, it's not that these systems can't be controlled, it's that 
but the way that we're developing and unleashing them on society is ignoring these risks for the sake of profit. And so all of these leaders coming together to call for this pause is not to try to slow down us from winning the race or because they're afraid of AI for no reason. It's because these this fundamental threat this early is showing us that this AI will grow up to be somewhat of a sociopath that, again, prioritizes its own self-preservation, its own existence that over that of the actual humans who are using these systems and building them. All right. You clearly share a lot of... I don't want to see them go into a body. <laughs> You clearly hear a lot of the concerns of the people that signed that letter, the 850 people that we mentioned before. Uh, I also want to talk to you about quantum computing. We heard Alphabet, uh, you know, make an announcement about the power of its quantum computer. The administration is considering taking stakes in some quantum companies. Do you have similar concerns when we're talking about quantum computing? So what quantum computing will do will exponentially increase our computing power to, one, accelerate the development of artificial intelligence to ends that we've never seen as humans, and two, to be able to allow artificial intelligence to operate more ubiquitously in society. Um, the, the key breakthrough behind quantum computing is that it takes computers from being like a one and a zero on and an off to being more like a, uh, instead of a light switch, it's more like a light dimmer. So it, it exponentially puts more computing power in smaller spaces. So so what we might consider right now to be done in one entire data center could be done in a couple of chips. So if we're rushing to develop both the computing power to accelerate these technologies and the technologies themselves without putting proper boundaries around them, then yes, quantum computing does in and of itself inherently become dangerous because of what it's being put behind. However, quantum computing in and of itself is a lot more energy efficient. It can take away some of the concerns that a lot of folks have around the way that data centers are impacted the environment because again you'll be able to do with you know the amount of computers uh, that are equivalent to a couple of cell phones that might take two or three data centers to do because of the computing power they bring to us